There's a video on YouTube that compares a $15,000 Mac Pro to a $5,000 Threadripper PC. You can tell I left some text comments saying I didn't think the video was done all that well. If you watch until the end of the video, you'll see I have a better benchmarking method. He did at least give us the specs for both computer systems, which is nice to know. One benefit for the 12-core Xeon is that it supports up to 768GB of RAM compared to only 256 on the Threadripper CPU, but to be honest, not that many people actually need that much RAM. I agree with his comments. If you look at the Threadripper PC, it only has 64GB of RAM. The 2019 Mac Pro has 192GB of RAM. Even when we max out the CPU and the GPU at the same time by running Cinebench R20 and Unigen Heaven simultaneously, it remained basically silent, which is incredibly impressive. Rather than running two programs to test for the amount of noise that each computer is putting out, it may have been more beneficial to render a 30 minute long sequence in Premiere Pro while simultaneously using Adobe Audition to see which computer gets stressed out more. We also tested graphics card rendering in the Blender benchmark, and the Threadripper PC finished the BMW M Classroom test in only 3 minutes and 8 seconds, compared to 15 minutes and 54 seconds on the Mac Pro. But that was in macOS, where graphics rendering is new for Blender, and it seems to not be optimized, as a weaker AMD GPU was much faster under Windows. The Mac Pro uses the proprietary XP modules, and I think it would have been more beneficial to the end user if Apple had used generic ATX graphics cards. Playing back tough C200 footage is much smoother on the Threadripper at about 45 frames per second compared to 24 on the Mac Pro. This is because Premiere isn't optimized and doesn't use graphics like Final Cut or Resolve, so the extra 20 cores comes in pretty handy. I'll get into the comparison between CPU and GPU a little bit later. Exporting this graded 4K60 project is more than twice as fast with the PC because it is all CPU based, so if you work with this footage in Premiere Pro, you want as much cores as you can possibly get your hands on. I agree. I'm not sure that using these specific filters and effects were the best ones to use to decide which nonlinear editing system platform or which computer platform is the better option. Our Mac Pro also has a big advantage you can't get with any other computer, and that is the Afterburner card, which completely takes the load off of the CPU for ProRes and ProRes RAW, allowing even an 8-core CPU to play back 6 streams of 8K ProRes RAW footage where this beastly 32-core would only handle 3, and the best 28-core Mac Pro without Afterburner would only handle 2. I think it's impressive that the Threadripper was able to play back three streams of 8K ProRes RAW when you consider that Threadripper only costs $2,000. For $4,000, you can get a 64-core AMD CPU. That being said, we don't know if Premiere Pro was being used or DaVinci Resolve. When we look at the Mac Pro with the 28-core Xeon, we don't know if the two streams were achieved with Final Cut Pro 10, DaVinci Resolve, or Premiere Pro. I imagine with the Afterburner card, you use Final Cut Pro 10 to achieve the six streams of 8K ProRes RAW. You could pay $2,000 for the Afterburner card and get more layers of 8K video, but you could also get a Threadripper CPU with 64 cores for an additional $2,000. What would be the better bang for the buck? The Afterburner card only accelerates ProRes with Final Cut Pro 10 at this point in time, but the Threadripper CPU would help out for 3D animation, graphic design, and audio editing. I'll be the first to admit, if you opted to get the 64-core Threadripper CPU, it might only play one additional stream of 8K ProRes RAW, giving you four streams. I want to say that at three streams, you're already at the point of overkill. Earlier, you stated most people will not need more than 256 gigabytes of RAM. I agree. Having said that, most people aren't going to need to play back five picture in pictures either. Let me ask you this. How many times have you done videos where you had five picture in pictures in them? 
If the answer is zero, then your commentary should be, hey, it seems like the afterburner card is obsolete since we already have computer systems that can play multiple layers of 8K ProRes. Having said that, it's not like in the days of DV25 and DV50 when you would digitize a three-quarter inch tape or a Betacam tape where if it did start to drop frames, you'd get these really weird interlacing artifacts and you didn't want to go down to half resolution because three-quarter inch VHS, high eight millimeter, and even Betacam can look kind of crappy at half resolution. When you're playing these video files back, you're just using a computer monitor. You're not even going out to an 8K professional broadcast monitor. You're probably watching it at resolution of 1920 by 1080. 4K, 8K, 6K, you can always watch those video files back at half resolution and get a pretty crisp clean image. I stated I would like to have seen the playback of Ari Raw, B Raw, GH5, and Canon Raw. He later writes both these systems can play back GH5, Codec, and Blackmagic Raw with ease. I talk about playback numbers in this video many times, but maybe you missed it. Now, the problem is your method of benchmarking. What you should do is simply take three or four video clips that are about 15, 20 seconds in length, make sure they're all color corrected, do a cross dissolve as well as a picture picture. Set it up identical for Black Magic Raw, Ari Raw, the GH5, ProRes, and even the Red One R3D video files. Sit there and play them back with the statistics of Windows Task Manager playing back simultaneously, just like you see right now on the screen right here. Let us see how much the CPU is being used. Let us see how much the GPU is being used. Put, you know, 8K video files from the Red One camera in the timeline of Final Cut Pro 10 and in the timeline of Premiere Pro. Like I said, do a simple dissolve, then later let it play a picture in picture. I want to see where Final Cut Pro comes in, and I want to see where Premiere Pro comes in. Your benchmarking methods are just horrible. You just say, this is what I did, and show us, you know, your, what would you call it, your charts and graphs. I want to see you do it like this from now on. I want to see how the system is performing and handling these codec files. Because I know with each individual codec file, it's different. Some of them, the CPU might be used more. Some of them, the GPU might be used more. But that this is exactly how I want you to do your benchmarks from now on. If you don't do it like this, your benchmarks are useless. When you do benchmarking videos, you always use the image stabilization filter of Premiere Pro. I think you use it constantly because you know Premiere Pro is pretty slow at image stabilization. One thing you always forget to mention is that Premiere Pro yields a better result than Final Cut Pro 10, and a lot of Final Cut Pro 10 users end up using After Effects or Premiere Pro if they have to do hardcore image stabilization. You also never mention that with Premiere Pro, you can export the timeline using Media Encoder, which allows you to work on other tasks while Media Encoder is rendering in the background. Rather than benchmarking computer systems and software programs using a handful of cherry-picked filters, like I said, why not just simply have three or four clips all with color correction on them, apply a simple transition, and a simple picture-picture. As the video is playing back, you can say what the settings are. You can say, hey, this is an 8K Red 1 sequence, or this is a 6K Blackmagic Design Raw sequence. And then you can comment on the CPU and GPU usage. You should be able to do the benchmarks really super quick.